I always feel the need to apologize to whoever edits podcasts that I'm on because <laughs> it's just like a really special week for them when I'm on it. <laughs> and then the bottle opens. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley, and we're finally back. The break is over. We were supposed to be back next Tuesday, but we pushed it one more week to make sure we could get everything lined up and be consistent for you guys. Again, it's still a bi-weekly show, so we're releasing every other Tuesday, not every Tuesday, but we have a bunch of really great guests lined up that I'm very excited about, including the guest that we have for today, which is Seth Worley. Seth has been on the show before. He's a good friend of mine and very talented filmmaker, and he just finished shooting his most recent short film and a very ambitious short Short film. So I thought it'd be great to have him on the show and talk a lot about why he made the short film, how he went about making that short film, trials and things that he learned during it all, which we're going to get to after I thank today's sponsor, which is Lens Pro To Go. And if you watch the show, you have heard the name Lens Pro To Go a million times. They are my go-to rental house. I have been using them for, I don't know, like seven or eight years now. I just love them. I love the people that work there. And that's a big thing for me with any company that I choose to really tie myself to like Lens Pro to go. It's not just about the quality of the company itself. It's about the quality of the people behind it because that speaks volumes to everything that they're going to do in the future. And they're just great people that care about the filmmaking community. And it really shows by everything that they do. And they're also giving you 20% off when you go to lenspro.com. Use the coupon code Podcast to rent your gear there and you're going to get 20% off. But now I'm going to shut up and get right into it with Seth. So you just shot a new short film, and I wanted to kick it off just talking about why you did this short film and what the short film is a part of. Yeah. So uh, I have been walking around for the past two and a half years with a feature idea in my head. I think I should, I'm going to say the titles. I'll say the title of the short. With yeah, because I mean, the, you've already posted it online. That's true. I totally have. I, I can't keep up with what I post. Like, I can't keep up with what I'm keeping secret and what I'm not keeping secret. <laughs> you you are more JJ about this than I am. Like, you keep a tight rein on, like, social media on your set and stuff. And I think over the years, I've either noticed, in my experience, either there is a correlation, and it is with my projects that I allow social media, they succeed and do better than the ones that I don't allow social media. So there's either correlation or there is no correlation whatsoever, and it doesn't matter. So in my experience, at least at this stage in my career, so I tend to let people just post pictures and talk about it and trust that they're not going to give away anything major. And even if they do give something major away, like, people are going to forget and the experience will still be there of the short. No one's going to watch it anyway. So who really cares? Um, <laughs> Comes the, out 5 million views first day. You know what? If that's what it takes, is if saying self-deprecating <laughs> things like that, if that's what it takes to get the, the millions and millions of views, then I am going to fail. I, I mean, if, the, that, um, <laughs> if, if that was the case, we both would have millions of views on everything we do. We'd be billionaires. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We would be directing Mission Impossibles 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 as well. <laughs> And Uncharted. And uh, <laughs> um, so, man, what was I saying? So I've been walking around with this feature idea for like two and a half years called Darker Colors. And uh, I hate the title. You love the title. The I think the title's sticking. But I take a long time to get down to writing a uh, feature. I've only written a couple. And I usually tend to walk around for a year or two thinking about it and outlining it in my head and outlining it on paper and which now exists, which didn't the beginning of this stage, story clock notebook and story clock workbook. I will write it down on pieces of paper. I find in writing apps, I'll outline this thing a thousand different ways. And then at a certain point, I'll just sit down and start writing. And that happened in January of last year of 2018. And by the summertime, it took me, see, I have like 20 jobs. So it took me uh, <laughs> till the summer to like finally get a, not summer, I'd say it was like spring, but still several months until I had a first full draft. And it was 160 pages, which is way too long for a movie, but it's a vomit draft. It's a first it was, draft. It was um, dense. Yes. And you read it. <laughs> I did. And uh, around that time, I had a, an all company meeting in Portland for uh, red giant, which is where I still have my incredible day job doing content uh, and short films and tutorials and stuff. And my boss there, Chad Beckert, he asked me, 
Well, okay, back up. So at these meetings, we often will go home and we'll all get this employee review survey where we get to literally like fill out surveys and evaluate each other individually. And if, you know, if you don't know the person, you can skip them. It's all anonymous. Um, although I'm convinced that, you know, if I could look at them, I could figure out who <laughs> filled it, whatever. But the point is my reviews, the reviews for me that people filled out for me all came back with uh, comments like, so I've been doing social media and running the YouTube channel for the past uh, two years at Red Giant, not making as much content, um, just mainly like focusing on overhauling our social media channels and our YouTube channel and being in Los Angeles, um, being away from my usual filmmaking team back in Nashville, all of these things work together to where I haven't really been making a lot of content. And fortunately, I didn't do too bad on the social media side of things and the YouTube channel side of things. I was able to kind of like overhaul and get things in a good place. But overall, people were saying in my reviews that I think the term was, I love the job he's doing on social media, but we basically have a jackhammer doing the job of a hammer. Several people said they really want to see me get back to making short films more regularly, which was wonderful to hear and meant the world and was, you know, an honor to hear that. But uh, so Chad, the my boss, came to me and said, hey, I know you are working away at this feature idea. Would you ever consider making a short film version of it for Red Giant uh, and let it live on the Red Giant channel, just like your other Red Giant uh, shorts? And you, know, you can use it however you want. You still own the story and you can, uh, uh, he's like, I feel like it could really help. Maybe it can help you in getting the feature made, but I just love to see you make something again. And I'd love to give you the opportunity to do that, which is amazing to have a boss say that. So that's where we are. Um, he gave me a decent budget. It went fast immediately. Like that money went so fast. It boggled my mind. Um, mainly cause I don't, I, I needed the jet skis as a thing. I needed them and I don't need to <laughs> validate them. Um, and now they're parked they're, outside and they're beautiful. They're sure. They're not on screen. You know, you can't see that value, but I think you can feel it from yeah. me sitting on the jet ski. Yeah. Because uh, of the joy that it brought you, you bring to the film. Yeah. It makes, it makes exactly. complete sense. Yeah. It does make complete sense. So I think we're done here. Good day. So so that's where I was. I now had this opportunity to make this short film. So did now, you look at it as like, I have this feature, I have this chance to make the short, and the short could basically be a proof of concept for the feature? Is that how you're kind of playing it? So look, here's the thing. That's what you'd think. Uh, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think a short will do me any good in getting the feature made. I don't think anybody's going to care. Like by anybody, I mean anybody sitting in an office with power to green light something or to throw money at me. And I'm not saying that I'm right. I think I'm more saying that I can't have any expectation that that will happen. Yeah, sure. I think back at, because like, you know, back in 2011 when Plot Device came out, that was when you could make a short film and that was when like pixels had just come, like the short pixels had just come out. There were several shorts that had just come out and then were getting like feature development deals and actually being made. Sure, that happens like still, but I just think the era of YouTube filmmakers being handed the keys to Hollywood, it's not that time anymore. It still happens, but I don't think it's that necessarily that time anymore as much as it was before. I think, um, it, I think, I think if, it's kind of just calmed down to the point of like, I don't know that a YouTube filmmaker is going to do a short film and go on to direct, you know, like Maze Runner again. Uh, but that's true. Yes, but I, I do example. know of after ballistic and everything, just from different meetings I have, I do have, know there's a few production companies that have created whole like little departments that are on the hunt for like new filmmakers, and they they do it that way. Like one kid's job is his entire job is to watch YouTube like uh, videos and short films and pass it along to producers. Oh, that poor kid. I know. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, the bottle opens, I'm sure. He's hearing us right now. Hey, man. Hey, listen. We're here. Take a break. We understand. Hey, love yourself. Do we, something for you today. We know what you're going through. It's going to be okay. Siri thought I was talking to her when I was apologizing <laughs> to the poor kid. <laughs> Siri's like telling me it's okay. I don't have to be sorry. Um, so, okay. Yes, you are hope. Like, your experience with Ballistic is hope for me that it does still happen. Um, but did we talk about the Mark Duplass talk last time? Um, we might have. It, we might have. I'll just I'll skim it. It's just basically look it up. Set a Mark Duplass uh, South by Southwest talk called The Cavalry Isn't Coming. He basically talks about, he like plays out like what your career, like if you're just starting out and wanting to get into the film business as a direct writer, director, independent filmmaker, this is what your career is going to look like. And at every stage of the way, your agent or whoever is going to say, 
this is it. The cavalry is coming and they're either not coming or they're coming and they have nothing to really provide for you that you want. And the ironic ending of that story ends up with you self-generating all of this work for yourself and then ending up being the cavalry yourself. Yeah. And it is a story you know very well. It's a story I may not firsthand know like extraordinarily well, at least on the feature side of things, but just in terms of work and making things, yes, I totally know this this feeling and experience. This is the fact that just that uh, some people, okay, backing up here. I'm trying not to get all like, here's why I'm not going to make it and why everyone else is. Um, <laughs> the goal for me with this short, first and foremost, like I said, it's it's an opportunity to, it's an insurance policy to where I've been walking around with this idea for two years. I love this idea. If by doing the short, it guarantees me that even if I never get to make the feature, I will have at least gotten to make something from this idea. Yeah. So first and foremost, it's that. And that has great benefit. Secondly, I think the huge benefit and the things that I'm listing here are the realistic, practical things that I can tell you right now I will get out of it. I cannot tell you that I'm going to get a pile of money out of this. I can't tell you that I'm going to get a development deal out of this. I can't tell you any of those things. And on my worst days, I would tell you. I'm absolutely not going to get those things. Right. Practically, I get to make a thing and then I get a practice run, which has been, I kind of didn't see that coming on this experience before I got into shooting. This, like the second we got into pre-production and got into casting and doing auditions with these kids, because it's a story, the short especially is a cast of all kids. The feature has more adults in it, but the short version of it is all is three kids. And the casting process with those kids taught me an insane amount about directing kids and working with kids. And it taught me an insane amount about my own script and my own story, even the story beyond the short, the feature version of it. Things that I realized, uh, for example, there's a school bus in the feature. There's a pretty big school bus scene that where something that I cannot afford happens to the school bus. This is in the feature, not the short. And if you remember, I had that bus pretty much empty except for the main characters and the bus driver. And I had gone out of the way to explain it away as like, they're the first kids on or they're the last kids on, uh, you know, or last kids off or whatever. And that's where this big event happens. And every, nobody was buying it. Everyone was like, why is this bus empty? Yeah. I think you were one of the people too who said that. And the casting experience alone in the short, I suddenly, I, I now have a list of specific kids that I can write characters for to put on that bus. So I can tell you right now, like I just didn't know how much talent I had available to me in terms of like, I'm worried about getting three great kids. How in the world am I going to get kids that can fill up a bus and I can fill a bus now with talented kids. I auditioned all of them and they're fantastic. And that was a really cool experience. By the way, I, I I've not answered your question and I've just moved on to other things. Is that okay? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's within the realm of the question. Yeah, it is. You're right. Um, well, so before we get into that, like more things that I've learned, the big stuff, like I'll answer your question, uh, which is yes, it would be great if this provided greater opportunity, but up at this point, dude, I've made, I've had a rip matic that I put together almost two years ago. And to explain what a rip matic is real quick, even though you and I both know, in case someone out there doesn't, that's where somebody will take clips from other movies, existing movies, and cut together like a like a sizzle reel or uh, even often a fake trailer yeah. to kind of establish the mood and tone of what you're pitching. And really talented folks with a lot of time on their hands will actually cast their movie with like actors playing characters in other movies. So like they'll be like Tom Cruise plays the dad and Naomi Watts plays the mom. I know in this movie, Naomi Watts is wearing a brown shirt. And in this movie, uh, Tom Cruise is wearing a blue shirt. And in this movie, one of them hugs a person wearing a blue shirt. So I'll use these clips and they cut together these am amazing trailers that look like Tom Cruise and Naomi Watts are in their movie and the story is playing out. And that's awesome. But I don't have the time for that. And it also, or the patience or the patience. And it, it ends up being a game of guess the movie and you, people end up being impressed by your rip matic more than they are by your idea. So for this, this is about two years ago. I went and I downloaded a bunch of cinematography reels of like our friends, like our friends work and uh, pulled just clips, not even knowing what actual things they were from that felt like the tone and mood. And then I, for many of these shots, I put in my own VFX to prove the concept that I was pitching and made this really cool rip matic that every, a lot of people loved, thought was amazing. And were like, 
why is no one throwing money at you? And I said, I don't know. And that got me really nowhere. I still couldn't even get into rooms to pitch stuff. And when I did and I showed it to people, like people would be like, that's really cool. And then it kind of went nowhere. And meetings were never followed up on. And so where I'm sitting, I've made that. And people were like, eh. And I have this pitch deck and I have a script even. And if I can't get people to like, basically it's just been this series. I don't even, I don't know if I'm doing this wrong. I need other people that have been on your podcast who are like friends of ours who are better at this and are doing this for real to tell me what I'm doing wrong. I would love to know because my experience has just been every step of the way, everything I bring, they say, great, now bring this. And I bring the next thing and they say, great, now go off and make this and bring this and great. And it got to the point now where it's like, you just need to go make your movie. And it, which is a really nice way of saying, I got nothing. I can't do anything for you. Like, yeah. go make success on your own. And so it sounds like a nihilistic, cynical way to approach things, but I don't see it that way. I see it as being practical. And I see it as like, I got this opportunity to make this short. I've shot it. I'm in post on it right now. What practical, achievable value can I get from the release of this short that can go straight into and toward the making and creation of the feature version on my own. Because I'm kind of just tired of making stuff with the goal of getting eyes on it so that I somebody in an office somewhere can give me an opportunity. Right. I'm at the point now where it's like, okay, if the cavalry isn't coming, what do I have to do? And so I think that answered your question, which was like, yes and no. Yes, it's there as a proof of concept to hopefully get people excited about a feature. Um, but I'm finding the people that I'm going to excite that really matter are the audience, not the gatekeepers. Yeah. And I mean, to a great extent, the audience can be a, a key to the gate. 100%. I kind of feel like the Duplis talk is kind of like inevitable for a lot of people regardless. Because, I mean, we even have friends that are doing massive things that have other properties that they've been trying to get made and still just can't. Because it's a you know mutual friend. Best advice he gave me was, you know, why are you waiting for someone to tell you you can make a movie? Why don't you just go make your movie? Because of the position you and I are in, we've done it on smaller scales. You know, we've built a little bit of a, a, an audience already, so it's it's actually doable to just go and just make your movie. Uh, so I'm I'm even currently sort of chasing both avenues. Like I I have the opportunity to do some pitching, so I'm doing that. But at the same time, I'm developing something that I could do myself. And the same way that you're saying because i mean the odds of someone saying yes go make a movie is pretty slim but you what's know, your answer to the question like why aren't you just going and making it it's you know it's not obviously just not easy it, you know and, and at the level i want to do it at could could i go out you know tomorrow and make like a hundred thousand dollar movie yeah but do i really want to make a one hundred thousand dollar feature no no y you know what why, i mean and especially happened, because what did we do in our previous life to where we were born as people who couldn't just make movies about couples walking on streets <laughs> yeah, that's, and, that's and the bummer talking of to it. each other. That's not us. Like the stuff that we love, the stories that we want to tell, they're expensive, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. And they have a lot of post involved. I mean, even ballistic, that actually started with me trying to make like a, I a seven, eight minute, just one location, chill thriller oh, with a little bit of action. Yeah, you know, we talked about it. And then the next thing you know, I'm sending you this 19 page script with well, explosions. I remember you sent me that script. And I remember also Tim coming back from vacation, one of his 20 <laughs> vacations he takes. And he was like, I'm just kidding. I love, I love Tim. He actually just got me a check that got lost in the mail. So I don't want him to hear me making fun of him. But Tim came back from his vacation and he said, you he like, for, he saw you. The first thing you said was, so it got bigger. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and he looks at like the list of people that are now involved in this. And even Arlie, I remember looked at, uh, you just recently tweeted like the one year anniversary of the shoot. And my wife, she was looking at Instagram and saw this picture and she was like, who are all these people? This is a <laughs> lot of people that worked on his movie. And I was like, I yeah, know, did you crazy. see it? Yeah, I remember even when I showed you the script, you, you were like, I dig it. Are you insane? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I, know. Right? I know. I know. And I was so stressed about it, but it worked out. But the, the short films I've done were like all, it, it was kind of like a five-year plan of me checking off boxes of, I know what type of movies I want to make, so what experience do I need to have before... It, you know, if no one's going to, you know, l open the gate and let me in and I'm going to do it myself, what what boxes need to be checked before I do that? You know, very much me and my brother, Tim, who's like my producing partner, you know, what, what things do we need to go through? And Ballistic was kind of like the last project that was checking off the last boxes that I hadn't really done. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to, I ended up just pushing, be like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do it at this scale um, because it was feature scale. 
uh, for a short film. So if I were to make a feature, that's exactly how I would make it. So so that kind of rounded it all out to where it's now I'm comfortable, like, you know, developing in that direction finally. So yeah, because uh, it's this weird elusive thing of you're like, when I make the bigger thing, I'm going to have, I'm going to obviously need to have more resources and I'm obviously going to need to think bigger. You know, there was this pivotal moment in pre-production on my short last fall. We were talking about something and you asked me how it was going. And I said, I'm like $10,000 short or more. Like I can't, I just realized that one, I couldn't, I couldn't afford more than two days of shooting. And I had written a 13 page thing that I, I, every time I tried to cut it down, I added a page, which you can understand. Yeah. And even in simplifying it by simplifying the locations, I would have to write explanations and basically like build and pave the way, pave the path and build the bridge or whatever you want to call it, like to make that work narratively. And that would add a page or so of like things to make the logistics of the production seemingly simpler, but I can only afford two days. And I thought, man, this budget is more than I've had to work with in the past. And so I thought I'll have some room to really get ambitious. And turns out when you pay people fairly or as close to fair as you possibly can, it's still never enough. And so I'm at two days And I realized I can't afford sound design. I can't afford an editor. I was going to have Lucas edit. I was so excited to work with Lucas finally. And he's been a real trooper though. And like getting to to work with me and then me saying, Hey, guess what? I can't afford you. I'm sorry. Um, But he's, (laughs) he's I know he's well, he knows that I'm the one, (laughs) I'm the one getting screwed in the end by not having him. He's giving me great notes though. And hopefully I'm planning to have him on the feature if I can find a way, but However, I don't, uh, what I'm about to say is going to negate that hope and dream, um, <laughs> which is, I remember I was telling you, like, I just don't have enough money to do this the way I want. And you said, well, you want me to find something for you? I'm sure we could find somebody. You just have to throw, you just have to make an extra BTS feature for him, you know, which you've done for me in the past. Yeah. And like, you were like, let me see if I can get someone on the phone. And I was like, hold on, wait, like an alarm went off in my head. And I was like, hang on. I need you to tell me director to director, friend to friend should I be solving this problem creatively rather than financially? And you said, well, I don't know. Are you, you asked me a bunch of questions, but you said, you, you said, um, how, uh, man, I'm you brilliant. Said, you written? <laughs> no, I know. Right. You said, <laughs> you said, have you, re- is this the best possible version of it? And I said, I've done everything I can. And this is the version I'm the most excited about. And I cannot think of how to cut this down without just, neutering it completely. And you said, if it's a thing you're super passionate about, then I say, throw the money at it and make it good. But then you asked me like, see, that was, that was nice, but it was, to be honest, it was useless. I don't know why I'm saying it. I'm just remembering it all in narrative order. But the thing, the thing you then said was you said, what is your budget now? And I said, it's this much. And you said, what is the amount that you think you can get for a feature? And I said this much. And you said, okay, how many days can you afford? And I said, two days. And he said, how many pages is short? And I said, it's, I got into 12 pages. So it's 12 pages. And you said, okay, in the future, it'll be 120 pages. You were like, but it sounds like you're already working at 10% of what your feature is going to be. Like, it sounds like if you can't make this work on this scale, you're never going to be able to make it work on a feature scale. Yeah. It turns out my budget for the short was like literally the f- budget for the feature that I saw that I could get on my, that money I could get on my own was 10 times what I had to work with on the short. And I realized it was like, wow, if I can't make this work on this scale, then I won't make it work on the feature scale. And it was that mindset suddenly clicking. It was this thing that happened when I moved to LA two and a half years ago, where the part of my brain that I feel like has made me successful at any filmmaking thing related thing that I've ever done is this thing that says, work with what you have, look at what you have to work with and work with that and elevate that. Don't sit around waiting for the bigger thing. Don't waste your time trying to get the bigger, brighter, fancier thing. You have this camera, you have these actors, you have these locations, make it happen or go home. And that part of my brain switched off without me knowing when I moved to LA because the way I've diagnosed is like I got to LA and thought, okay, I'm, I'm trying to go big or go home here. I'm trying to sell real ideas, quote unquote, to real people, quote unquote, I'm trying to make real things, quote unquote. So I started dreaming beyond my resources and, and means. And I had no idea how much that was hurting me creatively. Yeah. And suddenly our conversation where you basically said like, dude, this is all you got. This is all you're ever going to get. It just like that switch flicked back on. And suddenly I was like, okay, let's make this work. And I sat down and I, that day, so I had it to where it was four locations and I got it down to two. And that never would have happened 
had you not reminded me how dumb I was in that right. <laughs> right. Well, it's not dumb. It's just, you know, I think we just start wanting to be able to do that thing now that we want to do where we're just not encumbered by the price tag. But it's like, you know, we're but not. But what's wrong with us? There. Because we've seen it over and over again in our heroes. Like, they have those movies where they did that. and Or those seasons. Or that, for some directors, that point of no return where they hit that point in their career where that's what they did. And they stopped being interesting as yeah. artists and as storytellers. So I don't know what is wrong with us to where we think, like, in our 30s, we're going to, like, decide, oh, I'm going to dream blue sky and I'm clearly <laughs> going to succeed. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I mean, I mean, it's something that I, I try to keep in mind. I talked about it on something recently where it's like, I just try to stay uncomfortable as much as possible because I know by being uncomfortable, that's just going to push me to work harder and care more and be more passionate about the things that I can achieve because it's just, it's harder. When it's harder, oh. it's more worthwhile to me. Yeah. Jack White works that way. He has a great quote from, I think it's some White Stripes documentary where he talks about, he's like, I do far better work in a room with a, a broken amp and a guitar, you know, and a, and a shitty guitar than I do with a, in, you know, in an immaculate studio with all the means and resources available to me. And he talks about like literally just putting the piano like just a few feet too far to where it's, it's inconvenient to get to it on stage makes me a better performer and a better artist. Yeah. It's not, it's something about it being inconvenient. Like, you know, if, it, if there's just a one button fix for it, you just have that first idea, you push the button and then the, you realize that first idea. But if it's inconvenient, it's something where you have to go around obstacles to do it. Then there's a whole path of discovery of trying to figure out how to do it. And during that path of discovery, you find little gems because you're not just pushing that one button right in front of you. Okay. But I'm going to get real. I'm at a point now in my career where, uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I'm a better artist when things are hard and inconvenient. I am starting to worry that the results are at diminishing returns at this point. That like by, and this is the part I'm trying to figure out is, okay, like going back to making shorts more regularly, I'm committing to doing this, you know, for like making a few more shorts or making this one and trying to dive into this feature. But like, what if I go, I dive into this feature, I do the inconvenient version of it. And I have no reason to believe that anything will become of it, that I will be able to sell it, even break even on it, that I'll be able to put it in front of any eyes. Uh, and if I keep making shorts, you know, for example, like they'll keep going online and we'll promote them with a tweet and I'll live on retweets and likes and watch time metrics for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Like I sound like I'm whining and it's cause I am, but it's this, <laughs> I'm in this place where I'm like, there's gotta be more to achieve here with this work. And I can't figure out how to get it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's two versions of making those films. There's the inconvenient version and then there's the hindered version where you're not making the right version because you just don't have, you know, uh, the capabilities or whatever it is. You know, that Maybe it is this movie actually, to make this movie, you really do need that two million. Like, that's the cheapest you can make it for. Anything less than that, you're not, you're disservicing the story. So there's that version and then there's just the, this is going to be a whole lot harder but we can do it. I think there's two different types there but also I mean even if you go the Hollywood route and you get a massive budget there's plenty of films that either get shelved or make a third of their budget back and ruin a career or you know because so it's like rolling the dice no matter what yes you're right so that's where I'm at I don't know if we talked about this but I made a movie I made a feature 10 years ago in my spare time for no money with my friends called The Time Closet based on a short that I made and this feature, we spent, I think someone loaned us $2,000. We used it for hard drives because that's how much they cost at the time. And we shot on a, what was the Panasonic that shot to cards? It was one of the first ones, like HVX or something. Was that something? Uh, I, I know what you're talking about, uh, and I can't remember it the name. They shot to P2 cards. Yeah, it was, it was the most popular sort of digital, yeah. I'm a filmmaker camera. Yes, so we had access to one of those, and we had a... Red Rock Micro Adapter, which were like, you know, the new thing to be able to put on the front of your camera and put 35 millimeter lenses on them. I'm basically shooting film. Yeah. Is oh, what it those was were. amazing. It <laughs> yeah. was, I, I remember that feeling of like, this isn't 24P, that's all that matters, but good God, look at these lenses. We are unstoppable. <laughs> and the movie was so garbage. Not garbage, but it was just so, so mediocre. Like as I was editing it and finishing it, one, I was like, this is so much work. I was like, this is so much stuff that we 
we are I'm having to edit and then we're right. having to make sure we get it's so much stuff I'm having to track over the course of an hour and a half. All of a sudden it just hit me that like this is way harder than I always thought it was going to be. And I had made several shorts by that point. And I wasn't like new to making things like some kind of idiot. I was like, you know, I, I should have known what to expect. And I remember being just totally beaten down by that experience because what we shot looked amazing for the most part in the context of the times. And we got a lot of really funny scenes and nice moments, but like it didn't work as a movie. The emo- Some of the performances weren't there. And it was just something I was like, what? and then I hit me like, how am I, how do I distribute this? Like, I don't know anything about film. Like I don't want to just, I could just send it, put it in a film festival and like hope that we get what discovered. Like, what, I knew nothing about film sales at the time. I knew nothing about how that world worked. I wish I did. I would have been a little more audacious and tried a little harder early on because that was a period of time where I could still go and make something small for no money with no VFX or little to no VFX in it and be excited about it. But I remember finishing it and thinking, like, this was so much work and the only way people are going to see this now is if I make a big deal of it. And by making a big deal of it, I'm saying, look at this. This is the pinnacle of me and what I can make and be proud of me. And that hurt because I didn't agree with that. I knew it wasn't the best, as good as it could be and the, or the best thing I could make or that we could make as a group of collaborators. And I sat on it for a year or two and we released it as a web series because no one expects those to be good. Or at the time, no <laughs> one did. And so it's out there as like a web series. But like, it's been 10 years. I was th- realizing this the other day because everyone's doing that 10 year challenge thing. I was like, it's actually been 10 years since I tried to make a feature and I'm ready to do it now, but I'm also just still so frustrated with the fact that I can't track the like goals uh, practically. It's like buying a house. When you buy a house for the first time, you have no idea you're just doing what the realtor tells you to do. You know what I mean? Like right. you're caring about what the realtor tells you to care about. And you're like, oh, the appraisal came back with these numbers. Mm, yes. Oh, the cracks. Those cracks are bad. Foundations. Yes, I know these words. <laughs> I'm a grown up. And it's not until the second time you buy a house where you're like, you know what to care about. You know what people are talking about when they're talking to you because you've been through it. It drives me crazy that I have to do the work of making a feature, all that work to go through what I assume will be a really sketchy first experience of trying to get it sold before knowing what I'm doing to be able to do it really well. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But I think just the process that we've gone through and, you know, a lot of things that I've tried to do along the way, that whole five-year plan and hitting notches on belts is to sort of gain enough working knowledge to be able to talk to people and know who you need, know what kind of a sales team you might need. So you have a more fighting chance. And when, you know, it was like if, when you made your first feature, if I would have, you know, tried to make a first feature 10 years ago, it would have been doing it blindfolded, you know? Yeah, that's what it at felt like. At least now we're like, we have one eye free at least now. That's a good way to describe it. It's easier to do it blindfolded, I think, than it is with one eye free yeah because ignorance is bliss like you don't see all the <laughs> you don't see all the pitfalls in front of you it's because it can be a little discouraging a lot discouraging you know to all the obstacles that you know are in your way to try to to make it and then in the end for it not to be a complete and total failure yeah this is such an uplifting podcast <laughs> well it usually is when you have me on <laughs> and then the bottle opens well you know and you know i think it's important we're talking about these things that like bum us out because I forget that there are people out there who think that we've made it or that we're making it. You know what I mean? Right. That people think that we're in a place of success, which I mean, we are. We have plenty to be grateful for. But you and I both know that we have so much more that we want to achieve uh, in our careers. And so it's always encouraging to hear people because like nowadays, you know, we were growing up, our heroes weren't transparent very often in places that were just now they're getting old yeah. and they're dying and they're getting transparent about things that totally. we would have loved to have known back yeah, then. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people are like that, even where they're just concerned about what other people, what, it makes total sense. Like somebody hears this podcast and they're like, oh, he's not at all confident and I'm not confident in him from how he's talking. So I, I get that thinking. I just don't prescribe to it. I just don't care. No, I don't care. I yeah. don't care about anything anymore. I just <laughs> want to make friggin' movies. Just screw it. And I want my kids to be able to stay alive while I do make these movies. <laughs> that's a um, good that's, that's a good goal. That's an important and goal. Unfortunately, I've been achieving that goal, you know? Wow, bare you, minimum. You are such a great dad. I am. I just want them to be alive. <laughs> uh, to live a sufficient life, an adequate life. 
I just want the least for them, you know? I just want the bare minimum for them. You know? Like, I want to uh, follow in your footsteps. Oh, man. We've gotten so off track. You know, you know where I kind of feel like we are? Or at least where I feel like I am, which I would have killed to be here like 10 years ago, is just like, I feel like I finally found the bridge. Like I was walking around aimlessly looking at the other side of this vast gaping hole, not knowing how to get there. And I finally found the bridge. And I'm like, oh, this is it? But now I just have to get across it. Okay. Uh, I love that. I would say personally, I'm going to adjust it a bit. I feel like I've finally realized, like I've been at this ravine. I've been looking across it for forever and I've been walking back and forth, making lateral moves in search for the bridge to get across. And I'm now in a place of accepting there are no bridges. I have to build one if I want to get across. And so now I've been in a season of learning how to build a bridge and praying and hoping to God, I still know what to do with myself on the other side after all these years of learning how to build a bridge. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's not far off from what I sort of mean because it's like no, what, I, what I said was better and what I said was, <laughs> was better. You know what? Let's just go with what you said. I like what you said. <laughs> build a bridge. It's like build a bear, but for filmmakers. And it's nothing like that. That makes no sense. Well, but listen, it's build a get... <laughs> name. So I mean, it's close enough. Do you want to go to build a bear? Is that what you're asking? Is it just ask me, you know <laughs> that I love it. I'll, I'll, meet, I'll meet you there Anytime. at seven 30. All right. Yeah. And any, build a bear we'll be at all of them we're omnipresent <laughs> yeah. we're build a bear omnipresent but Pretty only much. in build a bears we're like god but only in build a bears uh <laughs> locations across the globe i'm gonna pause right there so we can again thank our sponsor lens pro to go because when we're looking for gear for our next big project lens pro to go is always our go-to source for pretty much everything from an airy alexa mini and anamorphic lenses like we've used on our shorts ghost house and chainsaw to tripods gimbals grip and audio everything that goes into making film. They have the largest inventory of gear that ships anywhere in the U.S. and the best customer service in the business. And they're staffed entirely by professional photographers and filmmakers, which is really useful when you need to go to them for information. I mean, when I shot the BTS for when we were editing Ballistic, it was done sort of vloggy style and I'd never done anything like that. So being able to go to them and ask them to help you put together the best package is really helpful. And the package they ended up up helping me put together was absolutely perfect for what I was trying to do. So if you're looking for gear or gear advice on your next shoot, I can't suggest them enough. Again, you can save 20% on your next rental when you visit lensprotogo.com. Just use the coupon code FILMRIOTPODCAST. But now let's jump right back into it with Seth. Getting us back on track, where do you plan to release the short film? Just online, just like YouTube and all that? Just the, the regular? Yeah, it'll be on Red Giant's YouTube channel. We're aiming around an April release right now, maybe around an AB, hopefully. Yeah. However, if you want to find out immediately, like be up to date on news as we know it, you can actually go to darkercolors.com and sign up for our email list. You will be notified the second it's online, maybe a little earlier with an unlisted link. Who knows? And you might even get some behind the scenes goods and stuff leading up to the release as well. Some surprise things. It's a really worthwhile thing to go sign up for darkercolors.com. And yeah, I literally just got a first pass of music today from my composer, Matt Pusty, who goes by the stage name Makeup and Vanity Set. He's amazing. He's right now scoring all of Payne Lindsay's podcasts like Atlanta Monster and Up and Vanished and Zodiac or Monster. He's like amazing electronic artist. He just sent me the first round of of uh, first pass of music on the short and it's amazing. People are going to say Stranger Things things in the comments and I just decided I don't care because <laughs> Stranger Things is awesome and this yeah. is awesome. So there you have it. I'm aware of it. I don't care. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I love his stuff. But what about when you were making the film? Was there any, I mean, every film I make, there's like a new revelation for me at least. Was there any on this one where it's kind of like a huge moment of learning for you since it's so fresh or or something that you did that you utilized from other stuff that you hadn't before that was just really helpful? Oh man, every living step of the way. Okay, so I'll just throw out little bites here of like random things that I learned as I remember them. One, I learned during the audition process. So we had kids auditioning. We had several, we had them audition on their own, like individually. And then you had them audition like kind of in groups to kind of get the chemistry of them. And the first couple rounds of the group auditions, we had them sitting at a table reading these lines to each other. And I, around the second or third one, I was like, hang on guys, I'm going to turn the table on its side 
Uh, I'm going to give you these water guns, and we're going to do the exact same scene, but we're going to be hiding from monsters this time. Say all the same lines, but whisper them to each other. And if you have to get loud, whisper loudly. And just focus on hiding while you're having this conversation. And it blew the doors open on these auditions. Like Suddenly, the performances came to life by giving them something interesting, unique to be doing that wasn't what's on the page. It just kind of broke them up to where they could. And I had heard that before. You know, I'd heard actors, you know, you see actors who are eating a lot. It's because when they have something to be doing, then their performance is more genuine and real. That was an interesting learning uh, moment. I also learned when you work with kids, I expected things to be imperfect. I expected things to be a little harder and to be a little more rough around the edges performance wise. Fortunately, I had three really good kids, like really, really charming, funny, talented, professional. Good God, were they professional. And I mean, they were amazing, blew me away and made me feel really confident about the line, the kind of lines I could write for them. I learned that kids, they naturally want to, you know, when you're a kid, like your palate isn't fully refined. So it's not very sensitive to like sweet, like sugary tastes. And so like kids, <laughs> that's why kids eat more candy than adults tend to. When you're an adult, you're more sensitive to that. And it's like too much taste, but it's that way with performances too. Kids want to, that's why Disney channel performances are what they are is because kids just want to yell stuff and they want to like take things from like zero to 50 in one line. And I learned that it's not only super helpful to like encourage them and tell them to like just say the line and to find ways to like bring them down, and just keep them grounded. But one thing that happened consistently was I would try to give a direction to one of the kids. And then as I was walking out of frame, their parent who was on set at all times leaned in and would say this one time I leaned into uh, JT, one of the kids and I, I was telling him, hey, bring it down, man. Don't feel like you have to try to be funny here. Just focus on just saying the line. And as I'm walking out, his dad comes in and he goes, hey. And he said something. I think this was the word he said, but he goes, Tilly. And then he walks off. And then JT gives the world's most perfect performance, exactly what I asked for. And I walked over to his dad after and I was like, hey, um, what language are you speaking to your child? <laughs> <laughs> and how do and I goes, speak it? And how do I speak it? He was like, um, you're, uh, he's like, oh, that's Tilly was a character. I, I don't know if it was Tilly or anything, but Tilly was uh, the name of the uh, character he played in the last movie he was in who, and Tilly was like this, he was this kind of nerd character who was more sarcastic and more dry. So I told him just to, you know, I was just telling him just to play that character. And I was like, do you have a list of other characters your child has played? <laughs> like, <laughs> can help me. He's I, like I, the I user like, manual. <laughs> it really, and, and I'm not kidding. Like every actor should come with a parent, <laughs> like every grown <laughs> actor should come with a parent or a spouse or something um, because like it was a collaboration with their parents just as much as it was with those kids and fortunately we had fantastic parents just wonderful people uh, who are all delightful to be around on set and were super game like we were in a cold freezing basement for one day and we were out in the woods freezing cold with a little bit of rain on another day and these parents are like out there, best attitudes, constantly jumping in and like clarifying my dumb direction into better direction for the kids. And I very quickly accepted it, that this was a collaboration with the parents and as much as it was with the kids. And it really helped. So you never found that hindering at all? They were always sort of on your, your team? Fortunately, it was never hindering for me. I know that that's not always the case with child actors, but we were also really careful not careful. We were also, when we were auditioning the kids, Anne was, um, Anna Fogarty, the producer was, she was taking notes just about like making sure to note if the parents, if seemed weird in any way. Uh, honestly, none of the parents did. So either our note taking was terrible or we just auditioned really great people all around. But she was ready to like kind of pinpoint and notice like if any of the parents seemed crazy or seemed difficult. Fortunately, none of them did. They were wonderful. I don't know how I would deal with it if the parents were nightmares and the kids were nightmares. I feel like you'd try to catch that. You know, yeah. If, if you didn't catch process. that before, man, that would be, <laughs> that would be tough. Oh, it would be tough. I mean, I was ready for, I'm always this way on set. I think it's a miracle to be on set at all times that anything is happening and that we're recording anything, um, that we're even there. And it makes me kind of a crappier director because I'll move on from takes just because I'm so grateful that they exist and people will consistently be like, are you sure? Are you sure that was good? You're ready to move on. You know, he wasn't even looking <laughs> toward like the camera or toward the actress. Like it's fine. I'll rotate his head in post. I know. I, that's literally what I think. And I, I did on this one. I had to very quickly pinpoint solutions that I would do in post to save us time on set. Because again, we had two and a half days, ended up with two and a half days to shoot 12 pages of, 
dialogue and action in these remote locations. And when you have kids, and these kids um, were amazing, but they couldn't help but look at the camera lens a lot. Yeah. Like a lot. And you've, you've seen the cut right now. Like you it's, it's all in there right now. They spike that camera quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but I had our friend, Daniel Hashimoto, who's has action movie kid, YouTube channel. He's told me so many times how often he has to, you know, action movie kid, his channel is the, you know, where he, for anyone who doesn't know his work, he takes home movies of his, of his kids, James and Sophia and like, you know, playing the floors lava or playing with lightsabers. And he actually puts VFX into them to make it like they really are doing those things. And they're awesome. And you've seen them passed around on Facebook and YouTube before, but the number of times it's, it will startle you. The number of times Hashi has had to replace James's whole face for several frames because he looked at the camera or said something like that was distracting or something. So I knew I could replace these kids eyes, which is horrifying to say, like it sounds incredibly terrifying, but I planned early on to lean on that in the event that something like that were happening. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, did you find directing them much different from directing adults or did you kind of approach it the same way? They ask a lot more questions. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, every actor is different. And I found that with kids, they're even more different from each other. Uh, I don't know it's a, if they're more different from each other, but like, for example, one of the kids, very analytical, his head was very much in the big picture of things. And was, if I, you know, I would tell him, so this shot, you're running from here to here. And, he's, and I'd be like, okay. And I'd walk away, I'd turn to the next kid and be talking to them about what they should be doing. And then he would... And he would go, um, Seth, I have a question. Are we going to do the part where I jump off the other thing that's on the next page? And he'd be like, yeah, we're going to get the next shot. I promise. He goes, okay, I have another question. How are we going to do that shot when we get like, so he was constantly wanting to know, like, when are we doing the parts that we're not doing right now? And <laughs> he needed to know not only like, where were we in the story, but where were we in the day in relation to the story and relation to the day. Whereas on the other opposite end of the spectrum, I had Lexi, who plays a character named Amber. I'm referencing people that no one right now is going to know what I'm talking about. But she's this amazing little girl. I have to stress when I call one of them amazing that they're all amazing in case they ever listen to this because that's absolutely true. And I don't want them to ever think that I have favorites because I can't pick one. But Lexi, for example, will I couldn't always tell if she was listening. And what's funny is I've worked with a few actual name actors who I had the same experience with them to where... I couldn't tell if, or like, you can't tell if they're listening and you, you kind of feel like, could you show me a little more that you're listening here? Just so yeah. I feel, can, can I get a copy? Like, exactly. And then they'd go and kill it. Just completely nail it. And then you call cut and then they'd go back into like being their kind of like, you know, hilarious floaty, like self. So you had one kid who's always in it, like in his head, thinking about it, asking questions. Another kid who's just like goofing around on the second you call action, they do everything you asked them to do. And a wonderful thing that I noticed was that like they all just wanted to make me happy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. like you realize that very early on and that is, that's a responsibility you have then as a director, as like a, as a leader to these kids, like they just want to please you and you have to give them that satisfaction every single chance you can to deprive them of that or to forget to give them that I think is incredibly irresponsible and reckless with these kids emotions and manipulative. And so I was very intentional every step of the way to point out when they did something that was awesome, which was regularly and to also be super honest about like any points where, you know, I thought they could improve and to not tiptoe around it. I don't know. I don't think I'm saying, I don't know if I'm saying anything that's of worth anymore. I think I'm just kind of ranting about how amazing these kids were that I was working with. No, no, it's um, good. I, I tell you, I had a moment on this because like, I'm talking about being sappy and just ranting about how great things are. Uh, anybody who's familiar was following my like short films and stuff will know that it's been a few years since I made one. And having been in LA for two and a half years, like if you've listened to the last podcast, you know that like it's a confusing experience to move to LA and with hopes and dreams and to uh, see what happens with those hopes and dreams um, in that process, and, which sounds dramatic. Like nothing's happened with hopes and dreams, but like to see how they're filtered through reality out here and to finally be back on set shooting something that came, I've been shooting commercials and stuff, but to be back on set for something and shooting something that has been in my head for two years and to see people working their asses off to make it happen. You know, that feeling, it's that feeling of yeah. like we had a production meeting one night, we had a half day and then we had day one and day two, we had to swap day one and day two and uh, like on the morning of day one because of weather. And so day two was going to be our hardest day. And suddenly we were now shooting that first. And that was a tough day. And we got through it. We survived it. 
<laughs> we got the bare minimum with a few exceptions of getting really great things. But you know, that's how most shoot days are. You feel like you, you survived, you got the bare minimum, and it, at best, you got a few great things. Oh, man. I, I don't think a shoot has ever ended without me going, I have no idea what we have. I hope that works. Yes. Well, I go into n- denial, and I don't let myself... I, I convince myself that we have enough. We can make it work. I believe in the power of posts so much that I'm in like I'm delusional. But I'm sitting there and we shot in my parents' basement, which was which I was a decision I made right after our conversation about working with what you have. And it worked out great. So like we shot in my parents' basement. I go upstairs, I'm sitting in my dad's like study area. Like my parents like study area of the upstairs of my parents' house. And with my core production team and with uh, Dwayne Logan, our AD, who's one of the best ADs I've ever worked with in my entire life. And he's an AD based out of Nashville. And I was so surprised that he said yes when I asked him to do it. I was surprised when everybody said yes to do this because <laughs> there's so little amount of money and so crazy amount of ambition. Yeah. And I'm sitting in this room full of incredibly qualified and talented people who've all just worked their asses off to make my thing a reality. And I don't know if you remember this. I called you because we were – we were basically talking about like, how are we going to make this next day after having experienced this day and seeing how long it takes to get to swap these anamorphic lenses, especially this zoom that we got that we wanted to use as anamorphic zoom. That was a 15, 20 minute reset every time we wanted to change lenses. So we're sitting up there like, we need another camera. And because the next day we were going to be in the woods with a jib and a movie. We we're like, we really could just use a second camera to put in that movie and have it live there. Um, and that movie can go on and off the jib easily. And everybody starts calling people. Like, and Chris Adams, DP, goes downstairs to talk to John Huber, our DIT, and who we rented a lot of gear from. And he's like, everybody's going in different directions to try to get things. And then they're getting things as people are generously. I called you in the middle of that, too, where I was like, hey, who do we know that could get me an Alexa Mini or close, you know, by Monday? And you were like, let me call a few people. And I said to you in exchange for the usual, which between us, we know that means like a BTS, like a behind the scenes piece or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm giving away all of our sponsorship secrets. <laughs> all of your sponsorship secrets. I like how you say you between please. us on a podcast. On a podcast. Between no, you I mean, between and us me. Speak, what I mean by that is, but between us is that Dwayne, Logan, the AD was sitting over there looking at me and he turns to Chris and goes, the usual, do I want to know what that is? And then he, Chris <laughs> goes off downstairs and he comes back up. He's like, all right, Huber's going to let us use his red as long as you can update his red giant software. And Dwayne goes, all right, I just said Seth call somebody I have never met before asking for a camera in exchange for the usual. And then Chris goes downstairs and comes back upstairs with his jacket unzipped saying he got a free camera for us. I don't know how you guys operate, but I like it. And in that moment, just like I'm laughing, ask. I'm laughing, but honestly, dude, I was doing everything I could to not just burst into tears like a baby because I did not expect to be overwhelmed with a level of gratitude that like, yeah takes control of your body. (laughs) Like I couldn't believe that all these people were like, they weren't just doing favors. Like they were there. They were, I don't want to say enjoying the work, but they were invested in it and they believed in it. And they were getting something out of this. And it wasn't just like, because you so often as a director feel like you're like at your own birthday party and people are watching you open presents. Yeah. But like, they're not just watching open presents. They're having to work really hard to open your presents for you and give them to you. And when you find those moments where you look around and people are just as invested in what you're making as you are and working twice as hard as you are at some points, it's just an amazing feeling. Yeah, man. That's why it's like, it's so quickly becomes a family. It does. You're just hunkered down together to just warfare together. Yeah, it really is. And then you feel, and you really miss it when it's done. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a proper like post production team, like set up, it gets lonely really quickly. Like, yeah, you know, I yeah, just it's, missed it's I, two major extremes for sure. Well, writing especially. Writing is like the loneliest place in the world. I say that. And someone is listening from like a prison cell or something. <laughs> someone is listening from <laughs> solitary. Like <laughs> do yourself a favor. Don't go to jail. Um <laughs> <laughs> but no, writing sucks. It's super lonely. And then post, and then when you release the thing, often it's like super lonely. Man, I'm a downer. I'm just like <laughs> Do you ray of sunshine to this podcast. Dude, I'm in the, I'm I'm just I'm fine with it being documented because I want to be able to look back on it and be able to point to like where I was and see how I've grown and everyone else can see it too. But like hopefully there can be a bit, some benefit here. And if not, Emily, you can cut this out. But I'm just in this very weird place of I'm ready to like be more challenged in, in this. Like I'm ready to be making things on a larger platform and on a larger scale. Yeah. And I'm just so frustrated 
that I'm not there yet, that all of the insecurities are just like, they're going around to the back of the house to find, let that sounds dirty. They're like, they're finding every <laughs> weakness they possibly can and attacking it with full force all throughout because I'm just in this place of like, nope, screw it. We're ending this war and we're getting to the next, you know, stage, whatever the war analogy or metaphor is. Uh, I'm sure you've been there and po- probably are there. What year are you on your five year plan? I, uh, I ballistic was the end of, of that. So if ballistic didn't, move, that was the end of the five years. Yeah. So if, if ballistic didn't move the needle the way I needed it to, I, I didn't know what to do next. I was just going to start a new, a new plan. Did it? <laughs> yeah. So it's kind what of are you on now. Are you just on, the, <laughs> are you on like the, you know, overtime <laughs> right now I'm in full development mode. So now I'm just developing features. So I have the opportunity to pitch some, like I said, so I'll, I'll be, you know, doing some of the Hollywood pitching nonsense. And then on yeah, I've the, read some of them. They're good. Yeah, yeah. Why? Thank you. And then on the other side of things, I'll be developing one that I know that I could just do myself because all the short films were also test grounds for how I could get the financing and how I would just structure have I read the one you can do finish. yourself? That's the one you currently have. That's the one we I'm reading right now. Okay. Yeah. When are you going to do that? Like, when are you going to stop trying to do the other ones and just do that one? Uh, they're all kind of happening at the same time because that one I'm the writer on. The other ones I'm not. And when you're Doesn't not... That <laughs> yeah, when you're not the writer. I mean, it's kind of awesome, actually. I kind of love it because uh, I love writing. But uh, first and foremost, I've discovered that I am a director. That is what I am. And then everything else falls underneath that. So I do enjoy writing, but I I, thought I, that. I like writing with people more than I, because I, I was oh, even telling my writers. I totally agree. Well, I was telling my writers, like, it's like, you know, I, I would rather you held the wheel and I just gave direction from the side seat until we hit like set pieces. And then it's like, okay, move aside for just a second. Let me, let me go ahead and crack my knuckles here. And that, that's the stuff where I know I excel at, but all the other stuff, I know what I want to happen, but I'm not the one that should have my hands on the wheels at that moment is what I've discovered, at least yeah. right now. I feel like if one of us could give up on being a director, we could do the other one a whole lot of good. <laughs> All right. We could like, draw like straws too. later. I like writing too, but like I've never found the perfect partner. Yeah. And that's always so frustrating because I work really well with other people. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. But it, what's great is like when you're working with a writer or whatever, it's just, you know, you're pitching together and it's like a little scary at first because, you know, it's people that have do actual things, you know, so it's a little intimidating. And then you're having a call and you're, these are the things that I think should happen in the story. And of course you collaborate and you kick back and forth and, and you just think it's going to them being like, hey, you're dumb and that's not what should happen. So I'm going to do it my way. But really it's like, they're wanting to make you happy just like any other aspect of directing that I've, I've encountered. And it's yeah. just, it's just been such a fantastic collaboration because then they go off and they make this thing that we talked about better than I even thought it was going to be. So, so far it's been really great, but on that side, you know, that clears up a lot of time for me because they're, you know, they're doing the hard in the trenches pieces while I get to develop these other pieces on the side that I know I can do if none of that goes. So one's not really hindering the other. They're actually kind of nice partners right now to where I can continue to pitch over here and it's not hurting me developing the thing that I know I can do over here. So it's kind of like my current mindset is like chase the thing I know I could do that's kind of like, hey, I'm headed towards this direction of actually making this one. But I'm also doing this because, hey, you never know. So I know you need to wrap this up soon, but I want to ask you, how many ideas do you feel like you have a year, like new ideas for like a feature or for like new story ideas? Oh man, I don't even know. Um, 10 to 20. God. But I wouldn't say those are ones that are like, yes, I need to make that. So like uh, uh, how many ideas per year that I have for a feature that it's like, God, I want to make that uh, two or three maybe. Yeah, still better than me. I was thinking about this the other day that I'm, I tend to get an idea and I get obsessed with it and I focus on it for like a year or two years <laughs> and then I eventually make it and then I move to like the next one. I have a few in the back, like sitting around in the back, but they're not like front burner ones. You know, I was just curious. I, th- I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the reasons that I like the idea of having a writer or just the experience of having a writer a lot more because it frees me up to think about a lot more things and not just have to obsess over the one because I work a lot better when I'm able to do many things at once. And not have to like, you know, I mean, force yourself to dive into that one thing, even the one that I'm doing on my own. If I could find someone to work with, I would prefer it. No, I do that, too. Yeah. Like I said, I've just been in this weird season where I'm all the things that I used to be very secure in myself about have kind of been challenged. Like 
I think we've talked about this, like going and directing commercials for a couple of years and commercials just aren't the most creatively satisfying thing. And it's also a world that like, I'm not necessarily great at it because there's not a whole lot of places to excel as a director, at least on the commercials that I, I that, you know, I've been doing, or at least the way I do it, because I, uh, like I said, like I may not be the best commercial director, but like I knew for a long time, I was pretty good at this gig. And so I'm now in a phase of like trying to like remind myself that I'm any good at this and at the same time, get better at it. And at the same time, jump to the next level. So yeah, I'm always curious what other people's outputs are and how they're better than me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I always envy your ability to write and just dive in the way that you do. I think that's just not something that's a part of me as much, which I just think is a great characteristic as far, you know, for being a writer director, I think you're, you're much more built for that than I am. Yeah. But you get more scripts done than I do. You and all my friends do. But uh, maybe, maybe because it, my, my bar is lower. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true, but I could stand to lower mine quite a bit. Into the ocean. Into into deep into the ocean. So the film comes out in April, right? And there's the website. People should go sign up for Darkercolors. updates. Darkercolors.com. Darkercolors.com. All right. Man, I'm going to wait and then have you on again once this releases and then see how things are going there. So that's it for today. Again, thank you to Seth and jump over to our website, filmriot.com forward slash podcast. Find the episode page for this episode to find more from Seth, including some of the stuff that we talked about today. And of course, you can follow me online at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Conley. And if you dig the podcast, rate it and leave a comment on iTunes. That's super helpful for us. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.